there's Prometheus in the title. I think there's Prometheus here, right? Yeah. Prometheus here, it's everywhere. Um, and if you've ever heard about my person, it was probably because I, I have been in this project for quite some time. Um, sadly, this talk is not really about Prometheus at all, um, which is, yeah, I mean, Prometheus is kind of the um, area where I have applied or have ran into a certain pattern of uh, log-free programming in Go. And um, so it's kind of has to do with Prometheus, but it's not really about Prometheus. It's more coincidence. Um, which is a very similar thing I ran into um, long ago, uh, 2015. GopherCon, the real Gopher, I mean, I shouldn't say that. The GopherCon in Denver <laughs> uh, was second GopherCon ever, and Prometheus was just out in 2015, and I wanted to um, uh, talk about Prometheus designing and implementing a modern monitoring solution in G. That's supposed to be Go, it's truncated for some reason. And I had like, visionary idea what this talk should be about. And in the end, I found myself just talking about how to increment a floating point number in a concurrency safe fashion in Go. Uh, still, the talk was well received and it's quite interesting. And it's kind of a prequel talk to this one because now I will again talk about incrementing numbers just in a more advanced fashion. So if you haven't watched this, there's a YouTube link at the bottom. You should probably watch it unless you already know how to increment a floating point number atomically in Go. There's another talk that is kind of a parent or prequel talk for this, which is given by Arne Klaus at this conference. It was not called GopherCon, which is very, very confusing, but um, so that's two years ago, 2017. I was here, as I said, I watched this talk and was very inspired by it. Um, and it inspired and enlightened me to do what I will be talking about in this talk. Um, so another good prequel talk to watch if you haven't watched it two years ago. Um, really nice, goes through all the concurrency patterns and go. And we'll talk about one here. The, yeah, now this is even blue and we have blue light, but you will see it because you will know it by heart, right? Because of all those famous go proverbs, this is the most famous one. Don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. That's the kind of essence of a pattern of com current programming called communicating sequential processes. Uh, that's kind of old, it's from the 70s. Here you can see it, 78, has a Wikipedia article. Uh, CSB, short, honest talk, explains this in detail. Um, we don't have to go through all of this, it's just very broadly speaking, go routines, channels, select, statement, that's all an implementation of CSP. And that's a really nice concept to do concurrent programming, and it's probably the secret source why Go is so successful in our modern concurrent world. It's really nice to circumvent certain problems with concurrent programming. It's a really nice high-level concept, but for some sim simple things, very low-level things, it might be too high-level. So in the one thing I'm talking about here, we unfortunately have to drop it and cannot use it. Um, so what we will do is the atomic package. That's what we will be using, and this is also what I talked about in my 2015 talk. Um, this is kind of very close to committing heresy, and also because it's committing heresy, it has warning signs attached. These functions require great care to be used correctly, except for special low-level application synchronization is better than with channels or the facility of the sync package. Share memory by communicating, don't communicate by sharing memory. They hammer it, right? Okay, but still, um, uh, I want to do it because my excuse is I have a low-level application. Like back then in 2015, when it was about incrementing a counter in the Prometheus instrumentation library, but as said, this is just the application I'm running into. You just have to increment something very often in a concurrency safe way. And the atomic package gives you really simple tools, leveraging CPU instructions to atomically increment a number. Usually an integer, if you want to do it with a float, it's a bit more complicated. That's why I gave a whole talk about it. Now, today, we want to talk about something else, which is histograms. Uh, so I cannot explain what histograms are. Stats class again, you might have slept through it, but whatever. Uh, Prometheus uses histograms as another metric type. It's really powerful. Um, the problem is that uh, you have to do many things. It's not just incrementing one number. A histogram is essentially a bucketed counter. 
So you have many buckets, and what you do, you do something called an observation. It's often latency of requests, so you serve a request in your microservice instance, and it's 104 milliseconds, and then you increment the bucket that counts 100 to 200 millisecond latency, right? But you also have to increment a total count of all observations, and you have to increment a sum of observations, which is the actual observed value, 0.104 seconds for a 104 millisecond request. So these are three things we increment. Now the problem is that Prometheus as a monitoring system works in this famous pull-based fashion. So the Prometheus server walks around and collects metrics from monitored binaries, your microservice instance. And that's a race, as in you have to increment three numbers. And if the Prometheus server comes along and scrapes those values while you were incrementing the first two, but not yet the third one, then you have a data race. It's not a data race like detected by the race detector. So no like registers or whatever broken or I mean nothing bad happens in your code, but uh, you still get inconsistent results. So it's still I still call it a data race, and you have to do something about it. Okay, um, naively we used just atomic operations on those three numbers. And we thought this will be fine, right? Nobody will ever notice that there are inconsistent numbers now and then. But of course, if it's a widespread, if your monitoring system or your open source project is in widespread use, everything will be noted at some point. And in 2017, somebody filed this bug. Histogram bright creates invalid results when racing with observe. Yeah, OK. So we had to do something about it. It's closed now. And that's why I'm standing here and can tell you about the solution. So I've already ruled out the proper, nice CSP approach that Go usually is doing. I mean, that would be semantically completely fine. Uh, I also demonstrate in the 2015 talk how you could do that, but it's just not efficient enough for low-level operations like this. So there was something mentioned, the sync package, sync, sync.mutex, sync.rwmutex. These are things from the thing, sync package. So you could use those. It's Mutexes are just mutexes, like Java programmers know them pretty well, I think. Uh, so you could totally use them, and that works. So the, I mean, that's not the real histogram code from the Prometheus instrumentation library, but the function signatures are the original function signatures or method. So histogram has a method. Observe, that's where you put in this value, like your 104 milliseconds, and then you can totally lock a mutex defer the unlocking, increment those three numbers protected under the lock, and now to read out those values um, and send them to the Prometheus server, or the Prometheus server fetches them, that's ironically called write, although it's the read path, it's a bit counterintuitive. But as I say, one person's read is another person's write. Um, so the histogram gets a protobuf here, that's because historically Prometheus was all protobuf based, and has to write those values into the protobuf. That's why it's called write. But it's the read path, and we also use the read lock here, right? So we do the read lock, defer the unlock, and do things. Do things means we get our three numbers, or all our buckets and everything, and put it into the um, protobuf that describes this one. And then the Prometheus server gets it, and it's doing its thing with it. Um, OK, so write is the read path. This is why you use the read lock. And now the read write. Mutex is great for something that often reads and rarely writes. So the write here is observed, the read is the write. Um, so in our case, it's exactly the opposite. Prometheus scrapes a binary a couple of times per minute. It's configurable, but let's say like every 15 to 30 seconds. Uh, observe happens whenever you serve a request. Go is awesome, efficient, and everything. So a single binary might as well serve thousands of requests per second. So this is orders of magnitude more frequently called than this one. So it's exactly the inverted case. The read-write mutex doesn't help us at all. In fact, this would be faster with a normal mutex. And sadly, it's still not fast enough. If you have lock contention a lot, like it's not horrible, but like if you spend more than 10% of your computing time just for your monitoring system instead of serving actual requests, this is kind of bad, right? Monitoring should be almost invisible resource-wise. OK, so prohibitively slow, we have to scratch that. OK, so buzzword, that was the buzzword from the title, lock-free, right? We want something that is lock-free or even weight-free. What that exactly means is, again, an honest talk. 
Um, I will not uh, dive into the exact terminology here. For us, something with the atomic package, that's log-free. We tried it already, but we notice if we atomically do three things that are atomic each, but not atomic as a whole, we have still a data race. So I thought I should find a solution. And at some point, I studied this excellent document, the Go memory model. Yesterday, we had to talk how excellent the specs are. Um, so I really wanted to understand how things happen in order. And the Go memory model essentially tells you a compiler can reorder anything at once, unless perhaps you think something, and it's already written here, um, uh, that you can do think atomic or something. But it's also written, if you must read the rest of this document to understand the behavior of your program, you are being too clever. That was already quoted yesterday in another talk. Don't be clever. OK. So I read the whole document. So I'm guilty as charged. What's my excuse? My excuse is that this Prometheus code is now not just our little toy project. It's running everywhere. If you travel Germany by rail, you will see those lovely platform displays. They run Prometheus. If you see a wind turbine somewhere, some of them are running Prometheus to monitor them. Like they, the world is monitoring everything with Prometheus now. Also, shocking moment, uh, godoc.org, we all love it. They list popular packages, and then, yeah, it's kind of not on the top, but client, Golang, Prometheus, it's down there. So people are using it everywhere. It's running everywhere. So to kind of stop uh, global warming or something, I really have to make my code efficient. That's my excuse for being too clever. OK, so now we talked about how excellent the spec is, but I wasn't any smarter when I read this, and I was still unsure if these atomic operations have a certain guaranteed order. And then I found this ancient bug. It's from 2013. It's still open. It has 51 comments when I took the screenshot. It has by now 69 or something, perhaps more. It, it like, get, still gets new comments. And um, this was about the problem that um, the memory model doesn't really specify order and how sync atomic interacts with the memory model. Um, but they discuss at length what the expectation is. And at some point, I thought this is exactly what I need. And I just assumed those, that those expectations are right. And Russ repeatedly says, I just have to write it down, and we will make it official and everything. Um, there is an ironic um, thing in here, because I gave this talk as a dry run at the Berlin local Gopher meter. It wasn't recorded, but I linked the slide somewhere. And then people posted my slide deck in this box. So now it's like circle is complete. They are already discussing this talk in this box. And uh, yeah, it's really fascinating. All right. So uh, now we will stare at code. And we will do it a bit like in, in Gautam's keynote yesterday that we stare at code and have to find out what doesn't work. Um, and I'll go through this, the basic ideas. And in the end, of course, it will work, I hope. Um, <laughs> OK, so step one is kind of uh, declaring partial defeat. I put into my title log-free observations, but not log-free writes or reads or whatever you call it. So we can accept that the right, it's the read path, the right method um, has a log, a new text, because that happens every 15 seconds or something, right? It doesn't really matter if it takes like 100 milliseconds to take the log, and it's much faster than that. So this is fine, right? We can lock this here and do the read sum count in the buckets and write them into the protobuf, protect it under a lock. We want the observed path to be without a lock. And the basic idea here is um, hot and cold counts. So we had the counts. We count in buckets. We count the total number of observations. And we count the sum of observations, which is a float, but atomic operations only work on integers. So I save the bit pattern of this float in AUN64. And this is a new struct, histogram counts, and I use this twice. Since I always ever use it twice, it's one of the rare uses of an array X instead of a slice. OK, so I have two of these counts, and I declare one hot and one cold. This is the first part of the basic idea. So the observations all work on the hot counts, and the cold counts are used in my um, read path. Um, so I have a hot index now, which uh, could just be a bool to say which one is the hot one. But since atomic operations only work on integers, I use a UN32 as the shortest data type that has atomic operations. If it's even, 
number zero is the hot counts, if it's odd, number one is the hot counts. Okay, so that's 50% of it. So now this is how log3 observe looks like. Um, so I atomically load from the hot index which uh, um, counts is the hot counts, uh, modulo two, so I can pick it, right? So now I have hot counts, and, and then I atomically add um, to the, like this, the white part is the normal code, right? You search the bucket you want to increment, you atomically increment the bucket, you atomically increment, this is almost invisible here, the total number of uh, um, observations, and this is the complicated part, which is explained in my 2015 talk, how to atomically increment a float. Looks weird, but believe me, um, I'm an engineer. <laughs> so this works. This is the way how you increment a float atomically, compare and swap, blah, blah, whatever. Like, Watch the talk to explain that one. You can ignore it for now. Okay, so this goes onto the hot um, counts. It uses atomic operations, so it's per se uh, race free. But um, yeah, we, we, we have to take the um, write method from the cold counts, and this is how it works. And of course, if you only ever look at the cold counts, never will ever, nothing will ever arrive there. So what you do first, you increment the hot index by one, which makes even odd and odd even. So you swap out. So the first thing in write is you swap out hot and cold. So the formerly hot counts is now cold and can be read, and the formerly cold counts is now hot to be used in future observations. Of course, there might be ongoing observations that are still going into the now cold counts. So this is why I put this comment here, wait for all observations using cold counts to finish. Let the cold counts cool down, essentially. Of course, that's a bit tricky, so I put TBA here. We will talk about this later. But once that's done, I can safely read some counted buckets from the cold counts and write them into the protobuf, and I'm done, right? There's a bit more. This is, looks super complicated, but it's actually very trivial. I have to uh, reset the cold counts so they can be used in the next swap, and I also have to update the hot counts to include all the values from the cold counts because we want to continue counting. That's all fine to do in atomic operations here. So this is just doing that, right? Very easy. Okay, now, wait, but how? How do we observe, uh, how do we wait for the observations to finish? That's the tricky part. Okay, second part of the idea. Um, so this is where the old ordering guarantee kicks in. And my assumption from that bug is atomic operations are guaranteed to happen in the order that you put them into your code. Okay, so this is the same code as before, but now I, I kind of extended my counts to have two. The, the total number of observations is there twice, count one, count two. Uh, so, and I start with incrementing count one by one, and I end with incrementing count two by one. And the idea is if they are both the same, no observation is ongoing. If they are still different, there are still observations ongoing. And I can look for that. Oh, okay. Almost invisible. I pointed that. Um, blue light, blue code, whatever. Red code is visible, but the blue code is important. So here I read the count one atomically, and then I just go into a for loop and read the count two and wait for them to be the same, and then I'm done, right? Then all the observations are done. And this is an important thing that was already mentioned in yesterday's keynote by Gautam. You have to tell the scheduler to do work, because if you don't do this and you only have one call, uh, then this for loop will just run and run and run, and this go routine will never let any other go routine get work done. So let observations get work done. You do this runtime go scat. This should work, right? You do this. Does it work? I wrote a unit test. It worked. I was a bit suspicious, so I wrote a unit test that is doing this like a million times. And the uh, frustrating result was it works most of the time. And most of the time, it's not good enough. And now, of course, um, it's again, like in the keynote, where is the error? Where is the bug? It's a nice example where like step-by-step -step debugging is completely useless because it's a concurrency problem. OK, I'll spoil it now. <laughs> the problem is, I mean, this, the left and the right part could interrupt each other at any time by the scheduler, right? So if this is kind of the not happy path, if this happens here, hot counts, this is incremented, and then at this point, at this point in time, all of this is happening. So before I increment count one, I have already read it here, and then the left part goes on and does its thing. So there are two unhappy paths. The one is, 
if this all happens before I go on here, I have the old count one, but I look at the new count two, which is already incremented while the count one is still old, then this for loop will never exit. Because I always, I mean, it's confusing because now count two is higher than count one. That's wrong anyway. You could probably catch it. But yeah, the other unhappy path is actually worse. So you read the count one, and then this goes on. But count two is not yet happening when this goes on. Because then count one and count two are both the same because I see the old value of both. So then this is running, and this will be running, and we are back where we started. We again increment bucket and sum, and we at the same time read it out to send it to Prometheus. Nothing gained, right? Uh, all the work for nothing. But, I mean, there's only one thing we need to do. We need to make sure that this happens, and this happens, and this happens, and it will not be interrupted. It will be atomic. So we have to atomically load a number and write a number. Easy, right? You call your CPU developer, your local hardware developer, please give me an atomic operation to read one value and write another one as one atomic operation. Software developer developers have asked for that many times. CPU developers say no. So we have to do something about it. <laughs> they don't like that. It's too complicated. Ideas how to do two things in one, you can't, right? But you can put two things into one integer. Why not, right? 63 bits ought to be enough for anybody. So that's the idea. You can actually make some back of an envelope calculations. How many observations can you actually do during your lifetime or the lifetime of your binary? And you actually will find out that 63 bits are plenty. So we can totally use the least significant 63 bits of this in 64 for our count and use the first bit for the marker which, our, which index is the hot one. Um, easy, right? By the way, I started this with the least significant bit as the marker, but then some Pascal on GitHub pointed out it's much easier. There's a pull request he wrote, so credits go to him. That makes the code a bit simpler and more performing and everything. So count and hot index, that's the new thing, the new hot thing, right? <laughs> so you put two things into one variable, and then you can do atomic operations on it. Changes are actually not that much. This is the uh, revised observe. So what we do now, we, it's my laser pointer, that works, right? So we increment this count and hot index by one, which increments our count and leaves the most significant bit intact. Um, and at the same time, we read out the new result. So now by bit shifting 63 bits, we can find out what the hot counts are. And that's all, right? We only have to do that. Um, now the, the count in this variable are like our count one, and the count two is just the normal count in the, in the counts here. Uh, this is almost invisible, so but this is the normal thing, right? This is your final increment of the actual count of observations. And uh, now you can do this, right? You did exactly what I wanted. Um, we do this in one step. Read out a bit and, and increment a number. Great, right? Now the right method has to be revised a bit, but it's really not a lot what we're doing here differently. It's just a lot of bit shifting, right? Bit juggling. So we read uh, from the count and hot index. We increment it, but we increment the most significant bit here. This is the one shifted by 63 bits. And at the same time, we read out the value, which is our count now with some bit juggling. And the most significant bit gives us the hot counts and cold counts after we swap them out. And then the rest is exactly the same, right? We wait for the count in the counts to be the same as the count we read from this count and hot index. Does it work? What do you think? It works. <laughs> I mean, it worked in my unit test where I did this a million times. Great. Release it. Push it. Tell the world histograms are now finally consistent. Great. Except that it didn't work. <laughs> so any guess what's going wrong? <laughs> I didn't hear that. Uh, I think that's not it. So the reason is, which like this has hit me before, there's it's called a bug in the atomic package. The variables that you act on atomically have to be 64-bit aligned. 
even on 32-bit platforms. And on some platforms, this is actually hard, like ARM or x86-33. And I thought I did it right, because they write here, you just put it at the beginning of the struct, and all is good. So I put all the stuff that I act atomically on it in the beginning of the struct intentionally, because I knew that. But somehow it didn't work. And that's where we have to go into details and have to find out um, how things are actually laid out. And again, thanks to Gautam, he explained yesterday how a slice in Go looks like. So of course we have these, uh, the counts are a U in 64, a U in 64, and a slice for the buckets, right? So here we have it. Some bits U in 64, count U in 64, and then we have two s the slice. So it's a pointer, which is 64 bit. Then we have the length. Here you see how a slice is laid out, right? The length is an integer 64 bit. The capacity is an integer. Then we have the same thing again. Some bits count and the pointer and the length and the int. Like we are only atomically operating on this and this and this and this and also the count and hot index, but they're all nicely lined. 64 bit, right? Now you could already, you can probably already imagine this is how it looks on a 32 bit platform. Unfortunately, um, they have 32 bit pointers and the length is 32 bit and the cap is 32 bit. And then there are three things in a slice which is an odd number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now the sum bits are not nicely lined, so the atomic operation on that one didn't work, the atomic operation on that one didn't work, and then this is again fine, and this is fine, but that's already meh. Okay, so what can we do? I mean, we could do some padding, of course, but I decided padding is just not robust enough. I just want to play safe. So one little tiny change, you just make this a pointer array, because then the two histogram counts are allocated on the heap, and that's automatically 64-bit aligned. And it's like the more, it's like slightly, slightly, ever so slightly less performing, but it's, it's just safer, right? So this was the change, fixed it, and now it all works. <laughs> okay, final code is here with a lot of inline comments so that insanity is all nicely explained. Again, don't be too clever. This is really important to keep in mind. You should not do this. You should not try this at home for no reason, right? I, I, my, ex my excuses were really that this code is running everywhere and has to be, like, there are some return the humanity gains from making this efficient. Okay, there is a link to the, all my talks. There will be the slides for this one as well, so you can look at it and have the YouTube link and everything. And I think that's all I have. Thank you.